Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for staying with us today. For this uh, closing session, our fireside chat, we're going to talk about how the LAN is moving forward. So you've had a chance to hear a lot about the activities in the LAN over the past months during the pandemic, about the resiliency commitments that many organizations are making, and about how they've begun to carry them out, as well as some great discussion of some of the obstacles along the way, how we can overcome them, and particularly some opportunities for alignment and collaboration uh, to make further progress. So in this session, we're going to talk a bit more about the criticality of these activities right now and what alignment and shared action may look like going forward. For, for this session, I'm very pleased to be joined by uh, several um, uh, leaders in this, in this area of work. Um, that includes Dr. Craig Samet, who's the President and Chief Executive Officer of Blue Cross and Blue Shield of Minnesota and its parent company, Stella. He oversees the strategy and operations of the state's largest health plan and, as you'll hear, is engaged in a lot of these efforts around multi-stakeholder collaborative movement to accelerate progress on value-based care. Uh, Dr. Pat Basu, who is the President and CEO of Cancer Treatment Centers of America Global, uh, Pat, uh, Pat uh, previously served as a White House Fellow and Senior Advisor working on President Obama's economic and health agenda and also co-founded Doctors on Demand. Uh, so from Doctor on Demand, he knows a lot about the innovative approaches of care. He's bringing that to specialized care, something that's been an important topic and moving forward together in this work. We had a, a really excellent breakout session uh, discussing some of those issues as well. Uh, Kelly Crosby. Uh, who is the Director for Quality and Population Health at North Carolina Medicaid, where she oversees all of the quality improvement and population health programs that are using advanced payment models and other interventions and some uh, uh, state support, as well as some multi-stakeholder collaboration to advance the goals of better population health outcomes and health equity and lower costs in the context of the pandemic and beyond. Uh, and also Libby Hoy, uh, from PFCC Partners. Uh, Libby and her organization are working on important steps to build the infrastructure and capacity for healthcare organizations to engage all patients and family from the bedside to the boardroom. This work on uh, engagement and empowerment is something that came up in a lot of the comments and discussions uh, today uh, to effectively address disparities and to make sure we are all moving together uh, in a direction of higher value care. So it's great to have all of you with us. And I'd like to start with just a, a few comments that, that might include some discussion about where you are and where you're headed in this uh, shared journey, and also any insights that you'd like, like to add from uh, what we've heard about uh, today. So Craig, maybe I could start with you. Thanks very much, Mark. It's great to be with you. Um, so I, I feel fortunate to be in Minnesota uh, just because I think the state is, is one of the early adopters of value-based care. But as you, as you know, Mark, and as many of your, in your audience knows, I've, I've had the opportunity to spend the majority of my career in value-based systems. Uh, so when I, I came uh, to Minnesota, I was already a believer in the land model and um, a pre-pandemic one of the core tenets of our strategic plan was a full-scale transformation of the state to a value-based model. Um, we were fortunate to make a great deal of progress um, pre-March in forging these advanced models in the announcements that we made in this regard with Mayo and with North Memorial and with Minnesota Oncology and most recently with Alina uh, and then MHN, Minnesota Health Network, which is a network of 47 independent practices. Um, so we've made good progress, um, and our hope is that this will start a movement here that motivates others in Minnesota to shift to population health. We don't want this to be exclusive, and we, we don't want this to just be Blue Cross Minnesota. And frankly, we'd want this to be a multi-payer, um, multi-provider, statewide collaborative with the recognition that better care at a lower cost is, is possible under an APM model and not as possible under fee-for-service. Our experience hasn't been without its challenges. Um, 
the first thing we clearly learned was that one size doesn't fit all in these APM models, that um, the models that we need to create need to be different between rural and urban or between academic and independent practice or between primary care and specialty. We can't have an infinite number of models, but we also can't have one. And so we've needed to be flexible in our APM design. Um, we also have experienced the, the fear of moving to risk. And especially with COVID, we've sensed a gravitational pull back to a fee-for-service model by those systems that haven't had experience with risk. And so we've, we've actually focused on advanced payments uh, to really help serve as a bridge from a, a broken fee-for-service model to a more progressive value one. Um, the, third, uh, the third lesson we've learned is we can't just change pay without changing support. And whether it's um, a willingness to remove sort of the bureaucratic elements of being a plan prior off or other enablement tools for providers, it can't just be the money. It actually has to be the tools as well. And then finally, we've learned that we just can't pave over the cow path. I, I can use that term now that I'm in the Midwest. I couldn't when I was from the East Coast. But we can't just go back to um, health being viewed as just clinical health. Our APM models need to include recognition that um, behavioral health, social health is as much a component of becoming a high-performing APM as, as clinical health. So that's the progress we've made. That's where we're heading next. Great, thanks, and some uh, really interesting and, um, an analogies today. Okay, I, I get the not going back over the, the, the same cow path, or we've heard about electric car, uh, uh, changing out the whole chassis, uh, lots, of, uh, uh, lots, of, lots of good analogies. Thank, thanks, Craig. Uh, next, I'd like to turn to Pat. Thanks a lot, Mark. Uh, nice to see everyone, and I uh, hope everyone's having a safe, uh, socially distanced afternoon, and look forward to getting together in person. Um, Maybe I'll just start similar to, to where Craig did. Um, many of you who know me prior to coming to CTCA, uh, I had more of a, a general uh, healthcare, uh, broader background where, where value-based care uh, was, was very important. Mark mentioned Dr. On Demand and the telehealth side, but um, uh, in my time at, at Optum United, as well as in the White House, you know, really saw uh, firsthand the power of of, of moving to a, a value-based care system and of equal importance, a, a word that, that seems to be uh, becoming more extinct, uh, sadly, as we speak, is, is the bipartisan nature of, of some of the programs that, we, that we're talking about. And uh, I think I'd be remiss if I didn't point out that um, for, for differing reasons, but for powerful ones, nonetheless, uh, value-based care is very, uh, uh, not only something that can save the system, but really is a bipartisan issue. Um, similarly, it, it cuts across all domains. Many of us come at this from a general medicine, primary care, uh, global cap MA perspective, but value-based care is really germane to you know, every specialty and, and domain um, within medicine. Uh, I'll obviously spend uh, a little bit of time on oncology. And uh, you know, to maybe set the groundwork there, I think in many ways, cancer is a uh, and cancer care is a microcosm for many of the problems that we see in American healthcare, and uh, really can be the tip of the spear in terms of addressing uh, you know, value-based care uh, solutions. So for those of you who are dealing with cancer in your populations, or sadly, uh, personally, because it's such a prevalent disease, uh, you know this, but it, it is the definition of a highly prevalent, incredibly costly, uh, massively disparate uh, care delivery system um, that, as I said before, mirrors much of what we see in American healthcare. Just, you know, some of the stats are astounding. Cancer care alone is over $200 billion annually, both in my time at United as well as uh, in Washington that, that essentially ranked it in the top, in the top three among specialty areas. Uh, for employers that might be in the audience, it's the number one cause of stop loss claims. Uh, representing about 30% of that total. The number one cause of, of bankruptcy, uh, medically related bankruptcy as a specialty. Um, and at the same time, it is uh, you know, just so prevalent. One in three Americans will be diagnosed uh, with cancer during their lifetime. 
uh, 1.8 million Americans every every single year. You couple that with just the vast array of, of pathways and the dynamism that leads to such variability in care, and the fact that about one in five diagnoses are, are misdiagnosed, which leads to delays or, or redundant treatments, um, really, really sets the groundwork for why we need um, to bring many of the aspects from that Craig spoke about uh, and that others have spoke about today, not just in the general arena, but, but specifically into oncology. Um, and in particular, there's a, there's a third dimension of cancer care that I just want to call out. Not only is it so costly and is there disparate quality because it's so emotional, I would say the role of providers in value-based care is even greater um, in oncology than it might be in other areas because a, a payer might be more comfortable inserting themselves perhaps into a, into a diabetic or orthopedic therapeutic option than they would be in, in cancer and in, in oncology for, for obvious reasons. So the onus really is on providers such as us to, uh, to partner and, and help lead the way here. So along those lines, in addition to the general uh, commitments that we've signed on to with the LAM, just a few other specific ones that I wanted to call out from, uh, from the CTCA perspective, just qualitatively a real commitment to work with uh, the CMS administrator, uh, CMI director, and private payers uh, to move to models where we can take on full oncology risk. Specifically for us, a commitment to take uh, greater than 50% uh, capitated uh, risk uh, with oncology patients uh, by next year. And expanding our APM population uh, to 50% of our, of our oncology uh, contracts, as well as increasing our, our telehealth and oncology infusion at home program uh, by 25%. Um, maybe I'll just end very briefly with um, some areas that are specific to oncology that I think are um, speaking for a lot of other providers in this area that I think they would they would bring to the fore. Um, one area is just finding, I'm just going to call it a fair way to deal with these new um, in-year oncology drugs. Uh, the dynamism in the field is both a potential boon for patients, but also a, a, real, a real nightmare for, for entities that are taking risk and finding a way to fairly deal with those. The second, given that I'm talking about a vertical attribution or a vertical specialty is the attribution model. Uh, thankfully, because of the success of the LAN and, and other uh, programs, we might find oncology patients to be already a part of another program, maybe a, an SSP ACO or, or in the commercial world, other programs, and really finding a, a fair way to attribute that patient and the, the shared savings. Because during the therapy that a patient has, active therapy in cancer, the oncologist almost becomes their primary care doctor. That becomes their, their number one diagnosis. Um, speaking of kind of the hierarchy of, of diagnoses, uh, I would say um, making risk adjustment uh, specifically tied to cancer complexity and cancer stage, as opposed to just generally, uh, you know, the cancer diagnosis itself. Um, and then the last couple that, that I found as barriers uh, for us to overcome together would be making sure that we set trend prospectively so that we can plan for those um, for those targets. I think a lot of colleagues uh, in the cancer world have um, been a little gun shy because of a sense that the target may have moved uh, sort of during the, during the period. Um, and, and finally, if it's not a full capitated risk program, finding ways to incent uh, telehealth or home infusion models uh, to, to move care to, to lower cost sites and lower cost models. So I'll pause there and uh, turn it back over to you, Mark. Thanks. Thanks very much, Pat. Lots of ideas for good next steps. So, uh, uh, Kelly, go to you next. Good to see you. Thanks, Mark. Hey. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, Kelly Crosby, North Carolina Medicaid. So, um, most of you know, or, or many of you know, that that we are one of the few states who does not have managed care yet. So, we will be kicking off managed care in July of 2021. It was going to be this year, but it's been postponed for another year. Um, so we have, I think a lot of the things I'll share and I'll, I'll go over them really quickly because I think a lot of the things that we have tried to build into our managed care design follow a lot of the good guidance and wisdom that others have shared today. So I don't think there's anything particularly novel, but we're trying to follow the right roadmap. So we've invested heavily in, in data going to the field. We've invested money and in infrastructure in the field. 
we tried to focus on primary care. Our system is heavily focused on primary care for the past decade. And we've given uh, particular attention to independence where we can. Um, we have set for our health plans really aggressive targets, we think, for the next three years of managed care for them to uh, have more and more of their spend in, pre in increasingly higher uh, levels of APMs. Um, and we've worked in the places where we do have mandatory APMs to align as much as we can across all of the health plans on, on things like quality measures and targets. Um, we spent a lot of time working on our uh, 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 data collection. So um, in our, we just found out from CMS today, we're very proud of this, that um, uh, CMS wants to know more about our race and ethnicity data collection because um, using their their markers uh, are, are, are quite good. Our data is quite good. So we're very happy about that. So we've been doing a lot of work to stratify our quality measures and setting targets around closing, closing gaps and to prevent health equity. I think one of the things that, oh, and the other thing I'd be remiss not to mention is behavioral health. Because a lot of folks today have talked about behavioral health. And we've done a lot to carve behavioral health back into our system. It's currently carved out. Um, one of the things that is very important to North Carolina that I would like to highlight, though, is our emphasis on uh, non-medical drivers of care. So folks probably know a lot about the investments we've made in NCQ 360. So uh, like, what is really important to us in our value-based models is being able to address and provide, uh, to provide data, to provide pathways, to do things that we can to, to to kind of knit together our health and our human service uh, sectors uh, to try to address the needs of our members. So that's kind of a, a kind of a hallmark of what it is that we're doing and we'll continue to promote managed care. Lastly, I would just say that we actually, I just came from a listening session and I'm about to go to another one. So we've been meeting with our providers um, to understand, you know, they know our very aggressive APM strategy. They know what we've put in place so far, but to better understand in light of COVID, where would they like to go? So we're exploring everything from population-based payments to primary care to, are there other ways that they want uh, us as a state to take a leadership role or to help align across our five health plans or across us and other major payers within the state? So we're, we're taking that time right now to, to work with our providers and to try to help because we really do want to advance APMs. Uh, Kelly, thanks for that uh, a quick summary of a lot of activity going on around advancing and, and aligning across uh, uh, diverse providers and, and payers and other stakeholders too. Um, Libby, I'd like to, to turn to you next uh, for the, uh, really focusing us on the, the, the patient and, and caregiver family perspective on all of this. Thank you so much, Mark. It is such a privilege to join all of you today. And I, I just reflecting on all that I've heard today that just really excites me for where we're headed um, with the APMs. Um, I think what excites me most about the conversation today is that value-based based payment models really value the role of community in each person's health. The community I live in, the access I have, that really impacts my health and well-being and I think um, there's evidence there to, uh, to bring that together. I don't think we can get to equitable care without extending financial resources into some of the community health activities. We know that community health workers are really effective. We've seen peer learning and support models in the ESRD networks be very effective for managing symptoms and group wellness care models as well. The people, the providers, the employers and communities have the knowledge of the issues and the skills to solve them. What they're lacking are the resources to pay for those activities. And I'm excited that the value-based payment models may be able to contribute to that. We really do believe the expansion of the payment models to include more community-based solutions will reduce the disparities of care that we know exist. I know today we've heard a lot about a person-centered health model, or I'm sorry, a person-centered health system that's responsive to individual needs, preferences, and priorities. In essence, what we like to call standardizing individualized care. I'd like to suggest that we also think about a person-centered health model as a, a lever in improving care. What I mean by that is the opportunity to learn about how the health system is working, how we as patients and family caregivers are acting, accessing both across settings, across care providers, across activities, and importantly, in the community. 
As a person navigating stage four salivary gland cancer, I have critical insights into how care coordination is working or not, how care is accessed and where the gaps show up. I'm the constant that moves through diagnostics across the radiologist, the surgeon, the oncologist, the PT, OT, spiritual care, community support, or my insurance group, right? I'm the constant. That gives me critical insights into the barriers of, for instance, accessing opioids at a community pharmacy after the cancer center has prescribed it. Building the infrastructure into the resiliency framework and into the um, APM models in and itself to leverage the patient and family caregiver perspective into the design and evaluation of activities provides a continuous feed to help identify what are value added activities and what aren't. Payment models that reimburse for value have to include patients and family caregivers into co-designing, co-defining rather, value to effectively address inequities of care. So I'm not great with analogies, but we've heard a lot of really good ones today. I'm just gonna steal shamelessly and say that as we shift away from the gas guzzling cars into the electric car, I'd also like us to shift our thinking about patients or the people we care for from being our customer for whom we have to design services to thinking about patients or the people we care for as critical partners for designing a health system that provides equitable care for all Americans. Our commitment is to continue to be a resource to all of your work. Uh, thanks, Libby, and we really value your perspective, your organization's perspective as part of these lands effort to make sure we're as uh, truly patient-centered as, as possible. Um, we just have a few minutes left in this session, so I'm going to try to go back to each of you with a, a, a kind of a targeted question about where to go from here, focusing especially on what you would tell to others who are coming at this maybe not as far along as you are. Um, and maybe Pat, I'm going to start with you and, and on behalf of healthcare providers. And you heard from Craig earlier, and we've heard all day long that this is a time when lots of providers, particularly specialists, are really worried about their revenue. So thinking about taking on these kinds of steps away from fee-for-service on top of everything else they're dealing with now, it's pretty daunting. Uh, what, what, can, what, would, what would you tell them? What can we do to, to help? And I know that's a 10-minute at least question, but if you keep it down to one or two minutes. Uh. Sure, sure. Happy to do so. So yeah, you're exactly right, Mark. I mean, I, I talk, I'm a, I said on a lot of organizations, a lot of providers, particularly specialist providers right now, first of all, they've got 99 uh, issues that they're worrying about. And, and so the idea of, of thinking about a new financing uh, mechanism is, is not oftentimes top of their, of their head. I, I think one is something that, that you brought up in your opening remarks today, which is the notion that, uh, you know, during COVID, um, you know, these types of models actually did better. I think oftentimes, you know, providers think that this is a, uh, you know, a, a, a road to, to zero, but rather uh, those of us who, who have uh, been a part of these models have, have, uh, have fared better. Um, I, I think the second is just the, the reality that uh, their tipping point has been hit and, uh, you know, to, to get on board. Um, and, and then finally, I, I, you know, I am optimistic that, Providers do want to do the right thing, uh, you know. Particularly in you know in cancer care, uh, you know. I talk to so many other of our providers. Some you know sometimes referred to as even competitors. We're all really trying to look out for patients and, and patient care, and the the data from a quality perspective is, um, in some cases, irrefutable that these models do help. In terms of what could payers do, something I've heard a lot as I've uh, tried to get other providers onto this bandwagon, particularly right now, it has to do with uh, setting baseline trend. Uh, a lot are worried that because of COVID, uh, trend is going to have been thrown off compared to a prior year. So a very policy wonkish uh, tactical recommendation would be to say that with our payer partners to, to make sure that current trend is taken into account when, when setting baseline. Yeah, on that last point, I think the, the LAN and, and uh, um, the, the rest of us working on this will be coming back to you. You heard 
um, Brad Smith's commitment earlier to work through CMMI on addressing exactly these kinds of technical but important issues where hopefully we can get uh, multiple payers aligned. Um, Craig, as a, as a payer now, uh, go, to, go to you next on um, advice that you'd have for helping other payers move along and, and, uh, uh, and make more progress as well at a time when I'm sure they're busy with other things too. Yeah, I mean, I, I think I'd, I'd, um, I'd compliment Pat's uh, comments by saying, you know, value-based transformation doesn't require us to boil the ocean. Uh, we don't have to engage in a value-based contracts for every product that we sell or with every provider in a market. I think we make progress when we have, when we can do this in incremental parts. So some of the partnerships that we've established have essentially said, you know, we don't have to start with full scale risk. We don't have to start with a full product. We can actually do a subset of a product and really experiment with those things that the provider is best suited to influence in terms of utilization. Um, and then I, I mean, I think also to, to Pat's comment about um, base trend, you know, we want to get into these value based partnerships because we want the provider to succeed under risk, not to fail under risk. So this isn't a scenario where it's a risk transfer. Uh, we call it a joint accountability model because the intent here is that we're both gonna benefit and most importantly, the patient, the consumer is gonna benefit if we do this right. So we have to put a lot of time and energy into the specifics um, so that the provider isn't caught holding the bag nor is the payer, but certainly not the, the patient either. So I think incremental and slow but steady going forward to value is what we would advocate for. Well, I appreciate that. And also your point about helping um, providers get over the, the fear by some of those upfront payments, some of those um, uh, non-financial supports to, uh, to help make that incremental but significant process go. So uh, great comments. Uh, um, Kelly, you know, we've heard a lot today about all of the disparities in the pandemic that have just come out and, and been kind of widely exposed. But I know with all the work going on in North Carolina, there have been some bright spots and certainly a foundation for having a healthcare system that is more resilient in identifying and proactively addressing some of those disparities for the other participants here today and those that we're reaching. Um, any particular advice you'd like to add? I know you already talked about the NC Cares 360 work, but any particular um, final advice on addressing disparities as part of this kind of effort? That is a really good question. And I probably, um, you know, very humbly say um, anything I would say, I'm not, I'm not sure it's, it's the best or right answer. I think there's a lot of experts here. I was actually listening to the other session as well. I mean, I know what we're doing, and we had some really interesting conversations with some systems today, and we asked them specifically about that. We said, okay, in APM design, we've heard you loud and clear. We got tons of feedback on alignment and tons of feedback on the, uh, the, the, the particular issues faced by role providers. So like lots of feedback, all the feedback that you would imagine. And so when we asked the group, well, how should we um, align uh, incentives or how should we put guardrails in our programs to really help us address disparities or to promote equity. And it was it was kind of silence around the room, truth be told. Um, I think folks were really, we're all struggling to figure that out. But something that one of our physicians said that I thought was so helpful was, um, we're not sure, but now is the time to capitalize on that, right? So this is probably kind of one of those uh, those moments where everyone is really interested and invested in doing that, right? So this is the perfect time that you're gonna have payers and providers with a common goal trying to figure this out. So I'm not sure that I know the answer, but I do think there's a real galvanizing moment here where we can all kind of get behind this um, and try to do something. I think we have a lot of basics in place uh, in terms of like being able to measure differences, but I think things like even risk adjustment models are just like, old and antiquated, but I think we have a lot of people with the same mission and vision at the moment. So I do think it is that, I think there's an opportunity to try some things because a lot of people are interested in doing something different. Thanks, Kelly. I know I, people have heard how the land is committed to make this a high priority yes. area for shared yeah. action uh, to help uh, to help us all on that that very challenging journey. And and Libby, I give you the 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 last word. You know, we've heard uh, a 
lot about the importance of person-centered care and uh, from Craig earlier about how they're, they're, while there are challenges in implementing these reforms, one thing that providers and payers and others can agree on is that we want to get to better results for people at a lower cost. So it really does seem like the kind of work you're doing and showing the best ways to engage and, and co-build these models with uh, patient involvement and diverse um, uh, patient perspectives at that is really important. Uh, any final thought to, to help us wrap up the session? Yeah, thank you so much. Um, boy, really what I want to say is the great thing is that you guys don't have to solve this on your own. There's a lot of people out there in the world, um, patients and families like myself, we have a community of over 620 patient and family advisors, people using their lived experience navigating the health system to inform the work that, that we're all doing together. And, and I would say that it is a moment in time where not only are, are payers and providers coming together, but don't forget us. We want to be here too. We really want and need a health system that provides equitable care. And again, I think we just are leverage us as, as a strategy for getting to the outcomes that you want to get to. And, and you know, Kelly, you mentioned a listening session. Start there. Listen, bring a couple people together and just listen. There's insights there that bring the surveys, the patient experience surveys are really great, and I love that we do them. Having a conversation brings so much context to that data that you're getting through your survey, so it either validates or it brings a little more information to it. So um, just start by listening. Start by listening and know that we are all here and we all want you to succeed in your mission because that makes us succeed in ours. Uh, Libby, thank you very much. I'd like to thank all of our panelists. You know, as you heard, we don't have all the answers. Uh, we do have some good ideas on directions, and and boy, this is an opportune time for further progress towards value and towards building a resilient healthcare system. Thank you all for helping us to to wrap up uh, the, the land summit in this session. Um, so we just have a few minutes left. We are not completely wrapped yet. Just a few more comments that I'd like to make before uh, closing uh, the, the 2020 first ever virtual land summit. And that is mainly to thank all of you. Uh, first, I want to thank everyone for taking the time to be with us today and bearing with some of the glitches that seem to pop up in this virtual era. Uh, I just want to remind you that if you did miss anything, uh, you may still get some of the musical accompaniment and the like, but the sessions were all recorded. They're going to be uploaded and on the LAN website after the event. Um, so that's one place to go for the kinds of resources and ideas that we've talked about today if you, uh, if you miss something along the way. Uh, second, I want to thank all of you for your hard work during this unprecedented pandemic. Uh, that includes the healthcare providers who are dealing with the surges and the so many acutely ill patients, the primary care providers and, and specialists and other care team members who are trying to redesign care around the whole person and do it, uh, do a better job under difficult conditions and a system under stress to help prevent those complications and, and those surges and to help address the really striking disparities we've seen in the impact of the pandemic on different populations. And third, on top of that, I wanna thank you all for taking uh, the time to think about and actually consider and take action on how we can do better and avoid some of these problems from happening going forward to build a, a more resilient healthcare system um, as well. This is, a, this is a challenging time, but it's a great time to work together. Um, we have a few slides up, and I want to uh, go to a slide of our, our LAN uh, Executive Forum members and give them a special thanks. Uh, they've taken time uh, away from their own organizations to focus on establishing this path forward together and to help us uh, collaborate on resiliency in our healthcare system. I think that's a great investment to make. I think it will help us pay off with moving forward faster, uh, but these investments are not easy to make. Sharing these ideas and, and being okay with the fact that all the details might not be worked out, we can uh, work on them together, uh, has been extremely helpful for the work of the LAN uh, in, these, um, uh, in the midst of the pandemic. And we appreciate all of our executive forum's commitment to the land's mission to accelerate the shift to, to value-based care and better outcomes at lower cost and payment models that are truly effective and the supports that are needed, the collaboration that's needed to get there. 
And not uh, and, and uh, last but definitely not least, uh, a special thanks to our colleagues at, at MITRE uh, and particularly at CMMI, the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation and CMS. They have worked diligently not only to make unprecedented changes uh, in CMS programs rapidly in a, uh, during the public health emergency in so much of CMS financing and regulation, but as you heard today, they've also been thinking hard about and working hard on how to make the CMMI models work better. And they've committed to working closely with the LAN and with other states uh, and private sector partners on the timely shared goal of creating a resilient healthcare system. So uh, we learned a lot today um, about ways to address inequities in health, including the role of social drivers, about ways to strengthen primary care and better integrate it with specialty services with uh, engaging patients uh, all along the way, about ways to encourage and support effective care and payment reforms across large systems, as well as small independent practices, and about this shared commitment across CMMI and CMS, payers, providers, employers, and consumers to do all of this together. So this is a critical time. I think you can uh, see on the, the chart, uh, we would like to get some feedback on, uh, on how the session has gone today and also about how we can work together uh, in uh, what still is a challenging part of the pandemic. Uh, cases are rising in the United States and we may be headed for a, a worsening phase. But as you also heard today, this is also a time of unprecedented opportunity to make progress on the goals of value-based care to spur innovation and to focus on population-based care in the most appropriate settings, including greater use of telemedicine and, and so many of the other good ideas that you heard about today uh, from organizations discussing what they are doing to make a difference in, uh, uh, in reforming care. So we already have broad participation in the resiliency framework, thanks to these diverse members of the LANS Executive Forum but we know this isn't nearly enough. And we really would like to encourage uh, all of you who have participated in some way today, all of you who are considering or thinking about ways to accelerate progress towards value-based care uh, to get more involved. We need your continued collaboration in the shift to better care and lower costs, supported by the shift well away from fee-for-service payment and into effective alternative payment models. The LAN is a public-private partnership, one that depends on your involvement for its strength and impact. So please let us know if you think you can commit to the principles set forth in the resiliency framework that we presented today about the actions that you could take and what obstacles you might think are best to address to help achieve the goals. And in, to help do so, please visit the website, join the listserv, uh, follow us on Twitter or LinkedIn. Uh, there are be uh, information there, just like there is on the screen, about ways in which you can participate. And we will continue to update you on our progress and, of course, welcome your further involvement. Thank you very much for your leadership in, in healthcare and improving health, and we hope you enjoy the rest of the day.